Welcome back, Colonels. Here we go. We're on the next day, next lesson, and uh, we hope that everything worked out with the first lesson, and we're going to give this another shot, and hopefully this is, continues to go well for you guys. Learning, learning targets for today. Um, hopefully we can understand signs and symptoms of a heart attack. We showed a video last, um, last segment that we did. Um, Dr. Stork talked about some signs or symptoms of a heart attack, so again, it's not always the clutching of the chest. Um, that happens about 50% of the time and it's less likely for women than it is for men. So men, yes, typically, but women, they might also be um, a little bit asymptomatic in, in terms of that, which means uh, they're not always gonna show the traditional signs. But what do we normally see, men or women? Um, it's typically fatigue, shortness of breath, maybe a pain in the left arm or the pain in the left jaw, um, anything from nausea to vomiting, lower back pain, especially with women as we talked about again with, with men, um, tightening of a chest. Oftentimes people say that it feels like somebody's sitting on their chest or whatever. So hopefully you know signs and symptoms of a heart attack and then know what to do if you would happen to um, have somebody around you that is having a heart attack, make sure we call 911. Um, some doctors recommend take an aspirin right away to try to thin out the blood. Um, but uh, hopefully you watched that video and you were able to see certain types of signs and symptoms. Today we're going to get to parts of the, um, the function of the brain and we'll get to that in a moment. And again, I have my second period class here. All right. Now, yes, or, uh, last class we talked about these three things, collateral circulation, bypass surgery, angioplasty. angioplasty. Don't worry about this top thing. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so quick review, okay. collateral circulation, you can live with a blockage here as long as you're exercising, again, 220 minus your age, multiply it by 0.6, and that's your target heart rate, and we got to exercise above our target heart rate for 20 minutes three times a week, and then we get to have these blood vessels branch off, all right? So let's move on and get a little bit more in depth about this, all right? So yes, let me go, red... Marker. All right, so let's say again, blockage right there. We can do, we can get, we can live due to collateral circulation this way. Okay, great. Then occasionally, remember, heart disease is the number one killer of all Americans. More people will die of heart disease than anything else. So occasionally, before something horrific happens like that to a loved one, somebody might go with a bypass surgery. So in a bypass surgery, we have a blockage. And what a surgeon will do, a doctor will do, is simply take a large vein, and I, yes, I'm saying a vein, and oftentimes convert it into an artery. Sometimes it takes, most of the time it takes, about 95% of the time it's gonna work. About, about 5% of the time, that vein doesn't convert so well into an artery. But what they will do, they'll take a large vein, and typically they'll come from the thigh. That's typically where we have our largest veins, and remove a vein from that area, and we'll make an incision and they will go around the blockage, okay? We call that a bypass surgery. Well, you probably have heard of bypasses a lot, whether it be on the interstate, you might have an I-275 bypass. Well, if, if 75, I-75 has a lot of traffic, you might take 275 to go around it. So in this case, this is a bypass surgery. Okay, and you might hear the difference between a single, double, quad, triple, or quadruple bypass. Well, all we're talking about is the number of bypasses that somebody has to go through. Um, usually it's about an extra 10 minutes per bypass. So there's really not um, that much of a, a greater risk between even a single, a single bypass and a double bypass, or a double bypass to a triple, or a triple to a quadruple. Okay, it's number number of uh, different avenues that that surgeon is creating. Next thing is is angioplasty, and angioplasty is pretty neat. They used to have to come up uh, through the leg, but now we're technology advanced that they can come right in through the wrist. And what they're going to end up doing with this is they're going to take a catheter, and it has a camera so they can see exactly where the clot is. So they'll eventually get to this clot, and this catheter is like this, and it will deploy a needle, I'll just keep it all the same color, goes through the clot, 
and then there's a mesh, and they open up like this mesh wiring like this. So they, they've inject, they inject, they shoot it through, the mesh now expands, and it, it, it's up against the walls of the artery, and when they know that they've stuck it through there, then they just suck it back in, like it's like a vacuum, or a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll use the analogy, of it's like a, a fishing rod. Once you make it, you, you cast it out there, and you've got it far enough, and now you have to reel it back in, and that's essentially what they're doing, is they, they take this, and now they're going to bring it back, that clot, back into that catheter, and hopefully they create a, an opening. Occasionally, this the, the, the walls will not be strong enough, and they'll collapse, so occasionally you have to put what we call a stent in there, and that will keep, that's like it's just a, a metal tube, that will keep, uh, sorry about my drawings, that will keep this from, from falling. So it's a tube that still allows blood to go through there without that, that artery collapsing again. All right, so those are options that we would use um, for anybody that's having some heart disease, collateral circulation, bypass surgery, or angioplasty. All right, so now that we've already talked about the heart, let's move on to today, which is the brain, all right? So here we go, the brain. All right, right there, what you're seeing right here, is the main part, the colorful part, is the cerebrum. We have our frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Okay, that's all part of the cerebrum. All right, I'll talk about cerebellum and the brain, uh, brain stem in just a little bit. Um, here, let's do this. Here you go. There's a drawing of it, and and I've, I've labeled what each parts of the brain are responsible for. Okay, our frontal is our largest part. Again, that's just right here in the frontal. I, that should be easy for you guys to remember. Frontal, frontal, boom, easy. Then we have something called a parietal, all right, which is responsible for, for language and touch. And here are the, the, just some simple ways that I, I helps me remember this type of stuff when, when I had to learn it in, in my freshman health class. Um, hopefully it will help you all. I always remember your parent, okay, top of the household, so it's kind of sitting on the top of the brain, all right, P-A-R, parent, okay, but in this case, it's parietal, and who's the first people that, that, that taught you to say anything, and you're one of your first words, oftentimes was mommy or daddy, so it's an easy way for me to remember this with language, and the first person who probably ever touched you was your mom or dad, they hugged you as soon as you guys came uh, into this world, now birth, you, you rest up against your mother, um, so language and touch, they were the first ones, parietal, it's easiest for me, the way, for, for me to remember, parietal, parent, language and touch, okay, um, frontal, I forgot to mention, that is responsible for memory and decision making, and I promise we'll come back to this because we talk about it quite a bit, sight is our occipital lobe, and the amazing thing about occipital lobe, and you might be going, okay, well, Mr. Coe, this is in the back. Yeah, it is in the back, and if this was your eye, you have an optic nerve that goes all the way here that connects all the way into your occipital lobe, okay? Um, easiest way for me to remember, occipital lobe. You go to an optometrist. They both start with the letter O. An optomist, optometrist is an eye doctor, all right? So it's responsible for sight. Again, little easy cues to remember certain things. Temporal lobe. Well, if you've ever heard the, the phrase of a man, you've got a bad temper. Okay, well, there you go. It controls feelings, right? Your temporal lobe, all right? We, we, we have the things called our temples. We, we should be able to identify where our temporal lobe is, all right? Well, our temporals are really close to our ears. Well, now we got hearing, all right, as well as learning. So, if we break this down and to make it simple, I, I think it's, it doesn't seem too overwhelming or too complex, okay? Temporal, hearing, feelings, boom. Occipital lobe, O, all right, for uh, optometrist, for our eyesight. Parietal lobe, all right, our parents, language and touch. And then, again, we get this frontal lobe, and uh, this is the hard part, maybe, for, for kids to understand. See, your brain develops from back to front. And this is the last part that actually develops. And this isn't really fully developed until somewhere around the age of 25, give or take a, a few years for each person. 
So that's why oftentimes kids will make, um, maybe make not the smartest decisions in the world. And sometimes they're impulsive and they don't think things through because this part of the brain isn't fully developed. We talked about in the last class about why kids are so stressed. And oftentimes you guys are going through the second most stressful time of your life because your brain can't process it. What's well, this, this reason? And then after the, you turn 25, the things that seem to used to bother you, they don't bother you anymore. Here, I'll give you an example. Um, when you were two or three years of age, if you would have lost your pacifier, it would have been, uh, you've been crying and it been, it been the worst part of your day. But now the fact is, you know, you lose your pacifier and you kind of laugh at that type of stuff. You wouldn't care about it at all. Again, as your brain is developed, you don't care about little things like that anymore, okay? So the things that you're going through right now, in a couple of years, you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I, I even stressed out about that type of stuff. Um, but it is the last thing to develop. And if you, uh, a lot of you guys are, are close to the age of driving. When you guys go for your insurance, oftentimes that one of the biggest reasons that somebody might get a lower discount is based on grades. Well, an insurance company might look at your grades and say, ooh, that person's making really, really good grades. They're being responsible. If they're being responsible in the classroom, they might be responsible out there on the road, All right? So you might get a lower insurance rate. But for certain students that are below that threshold of the age of, of 25, or in insurance cases, 27 oftentimes, they might be going, oh, they're making irrational decisions. And if they're making irrational decisions on a daily basis, whether it be in the classroom, they'll make it out there on the road. So a lot of times their insurance rates are, are jacked up a little bit, okay? Um, so that gives you a little bit of a, um, a clue. But our three main parts that we wanna talk about are our cerebrum, which we just went over, our cerebellum, which we haven't gone over, and that's right over here. And that easiest way for me to remember cerebellum, um, a bell just hangs low. You got that thing on the bottom of the bell. It's called a clapper that dingles back and forth. Um, cerebellum, it hangs down. Cerebellum is responsible for your balance and coordination. Okay, and then we get our last one, which is our brainstem, which might be the most important because it controls our breathing and our heart rate. So think about this. If a person would happen to have a trauma to the head, whether it be a concussion or even brain damage, we have to understand what part of the brain has been compromised. So in brain damage, somebody get hit so hard, whether it be um, in a car accident or a, a significant fall, um, this part of the brain may have been compromised. And you know whether the person would be on life support or whatever their case is, they can't breathe on their own. Their heart rate's not on their own. They need a machine to keep them alive. Um, they're not going to repair that. That's not going to repair itself, most likely. Okay, it's it's just not, unfortunately. Um, so keep that in mind when we're talking about um, breathing, a heart rate with a brainstem. Um, you might find somebody that's drunk or intoxicated and they, they're walking and they don't have the balance that they're supposed to, and they're kind of clumsy, well, the alcohol might be affecting this part of the brain, right, with cerebellum, um, as well as, and the reason why I'm bringing alcohol, because next unit we'll be talking about drugs and alcohol. So it's hard for us to understand where we're gonna go in the next couple of units if we don't understand this. So somebody might be under the influence of, uh, of alcohol, and, their language might not be there, and their slur in their speech, or their eyesight might not be as good, um, and they're making bad decisions. So drugs and alcohol certainly take place um, and affects all parts of the brain, right? And somebody's drinking way, way too much, right? That slows down their breathing. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight of where we're gonna be going in the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, as we're moving on, let me slide you over here. And right there, we have our nervous system. I'm not gonna to get too in depth about this. I think it's easier sometimes to break this into a flow chart. All right, so here we go, our nervous system. We all crave something called homeostasis. Homeostasis means to keep things the same. We all like to walk into this classroom and all like it for it to be somewhere around, you know, 68 to 70 degrees. Within that two degree mark, it's comfortable for us all. If we'd all come in here and it was, 
um, 80 degrees, we'd be uncomfortable. If we came in here and it was 60 degrees, we'd probably be all cold. Um, we all crave that homeostasis, right? But that's not society. That's not the way we, we live. We're constantly always being um, bombarded with stimuli. And whether it be, if you were sitting in a classroom and somebody walked in with a pizza, well, we would smell that. And we would start getting hungry. Heck, you might be getting hungry right now if I said, oh, there's a Papa John's pizza that's coming into this classroom and you start smelling. Well, you might start feeling that in your stomach, start getting hungry. Constant stimuli. Or if you're stuck in traffic, sometimes that stimuli is not very pleasant where people are, are laying on the horn and it's causing stress level to go up. All right. So we're constantly being bombarded with that. All right. So when we get a stimuli, it's going to branch off into our peripheral nervous system, our central nervous system. I'm not going to talk about our peripheral nervous system right now. If you perhaps take my health two class, we'll get into that in a little bit more in depth. But since we're short on time and days and all this stuff with the, with the, um, the coronavirus, I'm going to hold off on peripheral, uh, peripheral nervous system and we're going to focus on the central nervous system. Central nervous system, spinal cord or brain. So I get the question a lot. Let's see if I can find uh, what I need here. Um, Mr. Code, um, what's the difference between your spinal cord um, and your spine? Well, your spinal cord is a bunch of nerves wrapped up inside your spine. Your spine is the case. It'd be like this pen, all right? That would be, that protects what's actually inside here, which is the ink in, in the actual pen. This case all right, it protects it. I could throw up against the wall and I'm probably still be able to use this pen. The spine protects it, all right? But if I would happen to take this pen apart, okay, and I would actually throw this part up against the wall, this way my bus break. So oftentimes you hear somebody say, oh, well that person broke their back. Well, one time they might be paralyzed and another person's not paralyzed at all. Well, again, was the, the spinal cord severed? Was those nerve endings cut, okay? If so, there's gonna perhaps be paralysis of some degree, okay? Where they might not be able to control two limbs, four limbs, or whatever the case is. All right, so here we go to brain. We've already talked about that, cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem. We talked about it right there. So again, I'm trying to move very quickly to save your time, and, and so, as we go through this, again, feel free to, to pause this, go back, whatever you need to. All right, last thing we're going to talk about today. All right, now, if we're talking about our nervous system, we, we just talked about, now we're going to break this down into something smaller, and that's an actual nerve. All right, so I'll do a quick labeling here. All right, these things right here, these um, little tentacles looking things, those things are called dendrites. Okay, here is our nucleus, right there. Oh, that's what I get when I when I try to write too fast. Alright, and here we go, our cell body. That circle right there. Alright. So we're constantly we talked about stimuli. Well, stimuli is coming from all these dendrites and it comes to our nucleus and we can't send a million bazillion messages or our, our brain could not function that way. It'd be way too much. So it is able to slow it down. It takes that, that stimuli all into that, that cell body and it sends one signal instead of a million. And as it sends a signal, it goes down this part. Let's call it axon. All right, and it sends it all the way down the signal to what we call a synapse. And a synapse is just an area between a different type of nerve. And we do have things that we call neurotransmitters. Let me help you out here. Oops, there we go. Neurotransmitters. And you may have heard of some of these before. Dopamine, okay? We oftentimes get dopamine um, when we see, when we get some type of pleasure, somebody just gave you $20 or you got to go on top of a roller coaster and get a ride. And it's in a rush. We, we like getting certain types of things and we get this neurotransmitter that's released in our body called dopamine. We also have some GABA, 
uh, glutamate, serotonin, ACL, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So some of it in involves our cognitive ability, the way we process and we, can, we learn. Some of it's based on mood. Some of it's based on survival instincts, like fight and flight response. Um, but we'll get into neurotransmitters a little bit more later. But these neurotransmitters are active between these synapses, okay? And so we're able to convey one message, and it goes down through our axon, and it relates, it, 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 excuse me, transmits through another axon, and it goes all the way up through our central nervous system, right? To our brain, our brain is able to process this and then send one signal back to that particular muscle to do something. So it might be me touching a hot stove. And if I didn't have the, this process, I would constantly be burning my hand. But the fact that my nerves sends a signal up to my brain and my brain says, hey dummy, take, take that daggone finger off the stove it sends that one signal back and it allows those, nerve, or those nerves to fire, which are connected to our muscles. And now I can remove that, uh, that hand or that finger from the stove by that quick process. And it's amazing how fast that signal can be transmitted all the way up to the brain and all the way back. All right. Now, occasionally that doesn't happen because on this axon, and this is the last thing we're going to say, we have something that protects it. All right. And this is called a myelin sheath. L I E N. All right, and this myelin sheath is a protection for this axon. It would be like if you took ear, your um, earbuds and you had that, that rubber cord, okay? You got the wire inside the rubber, the rubber protects the axon. This myelin sheath protects that axon. And if we would take that rubber and just start to slowly peel it off or take little parts of that rubber along that, those earbuds, and you're trying to listen to your music, but you had a couple little cuts and dings and, and holes in that, you might hear some static. You might have that music cutting in and out, and it might not exactly work the way that you want it. And occasionally that happens in our body, and it happens in a disease called multiple sclerosis. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you have not. I'm going to put a link at the bottom of the page. Um, it's, um, it's a show, or excuse me, it's a documentary called Catching Kayla. It's a fantastic docu documentary. Um, if, you, if you want to watch it, great. It'll give you a better understanding about this. But again, this acts under your body is fighting against itself, right? And so here are some holes. Well, now as that signal's trying to be transmitted, all right, some of that signal gets lost, all right? And unfortunately, with multiple sclerosis, it's a progressive disease that's only going to get worse over time, and you'll end up having more of this myelin sheath being removed, okay? So that is, we talked about the heart, reviewed that, angioplasty, clotter circulation, bypass, signs of a heart attack. Um, we talked about the brain, all right? Talked about the brain, the functions of it, our spinal cord, excuse me, our nervous system, and the way, I thought it was easier with the flow chart, okay? Don't, again, don't worry about peripheral nervous system. And then we talked about um, actual nerves, synapses, axons, dendrites, okay? Um, not too complex, so don't stress out about it. Say, oh, Mr. Code, you went way too fast. I know it's complex information. We'll keep it bare minimum. Again, um, we want to make this easy, easy for you as possible and uh, in these trying times. But uh, I miss you guys dearly, and uh, we'll play another video tomorrow. So, all right, take care. Bye-bye.